All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Humanizing Your Brand webinar series sponsored by Online Optimism. I'm your host, Sam Olmsted, um, floating through this green background here. And uh, throughout this series, you'll be learning how to connect with your audience, build trust with your customers, and grow your organization by creating a more human brand with a more personal touch. I'm gonna wait a few minutes um, just to make sure anyone else who may be trickling in can join us here. So um, we'll give it about you know one more minute and then we'll get started. All right, I see a few more people coming in here. So um, we'll just get going. Uh, each week, we are featuring two industry-leading experts who have proven track records and insider tips that will help reshape your brand's focus and the core messaging. Um, before we get started, let's discuss the format of this webinar. Each speaker will present for about 20 minutes, and we'll have a 20-minute Q&A after both presentations are complete. So feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A chat. Um, and if there are questions about the format or the process of the webinar, we can answer those directly. Um, but if there are questions for the speakers themselves, um, we're just going to answer those at the end of the speaker sessions, and I'll do a verbal uh, Q&A session out loud when they're done presenting. So don't worry, your questions will be answered. Um, as your host, I've muted all the attendees throughout the webinar to cut down on any background noise, uh, but feel free to add your thoughts in the chat as we go. I um, want to make sure that there's an open dialogue. And last thing is we'll be recording this webinar. Um, this is actually week two of our six week series. So we'll be posting the webinar online and you'll have all that information at the end of the presentations. Let's get started. All right, so as I said, this is our second week of the Humanizing Your Brand webinar series. And I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker today. Um, Dr. Candice R. Hollenbeck has a PhD in consumer learning and education with an emphasis in sociocultural and symbolic dimensions and consumption and the cultural ecology of marketing. At the University of Georgia, she works as a senior lecturer in addition to conducting research in consumer behavior, brand meaning, consumer identity, and social media consumption. Take it away, Dr. Hollenbeck. Hi, thank you, Sam. So um, let me sh share my screen with you all. Okay, so humanity and how we should study um, consumers to understand our humanity. So when we look at studying our behavior, a lot of times we want research to come back and look really neat and clean. Um, as this picture shows, very colorful, easy to look at. But then what happens is that our research sometimes comes back and looks really messy and we don't know how to manage it or it looks uh, kind of crazy like this picture. And another aspect of research is that we, we like to quantify people. We like to look at more of a quantification and not really the depth of a person. So if I were describing someone like myself, I might say somewhere between the ages of 35 and 45, graduate school, an early adopter and so forth, but you really don't know much about me as a person. So when we look at um, research, there's another aspect. I know Irene's gonna go into more of the quantitative approach, but I am gonna speak about the qualitative approach. And the qualitative approach, um, as Albert Einstein has a great saying, he says that not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. And so when we think about qualitative research, we're really looking at this behavioral type approach of really looking at why people consume the way they do, what, why they are behaving the way they are, and looking at this natural setting. We want to get as that natural context as much as we can. So this is a, a cartoon by the far side, you know, and you have the, the people hiding, it's the, the tribes putting away their um, technology, anthropologist, anthropologist, and trying to hide the, what is their natural setting. So just kind of showing that sometimes it can be challenging for researchers to get at that natural uh, setting and human context that we are trying to aim at. So that is why we have the art of asking questions. In qualitative research, we want to ask really good questions. Um, and interviews are not designed to kind of test hypotheses or corroborate an opinion, but it's more of 
seeking those deeper meanings, um, exploring those phenomenon and trying to get at that deeper insight. So when we look at how do we do that, some aspects of doing that is the projective creative exercises. Projective techniques are one way, I mean, you can, you can get an entire book on different types of projective techniques, but uh, just a few of my favorite. One is the guided fantasy. Um, it's a suggestive state where you get consumers to think about, you know, tell me about what it would be like to be in a luxurious type of vacation. Where would you go? Where would you stay? What would you be doing? Um, another one is asking the wrong, uh, what are the wrong answers? Give me the wrong thing to do. What is the wrong way to pick facial cream? Um, you, ambiguities, paradoxes, like looking at how far we can extend a brand. You know, what would Doritos dog food be like? Um, just getting consumers to think off the, you know, you know, when we look at quantitative, just a comparison, it's more of that top of mind, whereas qualitative, we want to go beneath the surface. We want to try to get, and so some of these questions, you're like, that's kind of crazy. Why would you ask that? But it's getting them to think beyond just top of mind answers. Creative, it almost stops them like, oh, wait, I haven't thought of that before or trying to come up with something new. Product obituary, another thing I've been doing with my classes for about 10 years now, I've asked them about macaron, craft macaroni and cheese. So craft macaroni and cheese 10 years ago, can, my students would say, oh, I love it. You know, if, if they're writing an obituary, be, I miss you so much, I don't want you to leave. Whereas now, fast forward 10 years, I've seen the evolution of craft macaroni and cheese where there's much more consciousness of the health aspect and, and now, you know, college students almost say, you know, good riddance, I don't need you. Um, you're not healthy, you're not good for me. So when we think of that, that kind of gives us that deeper connection to the brand and what it means to uh, consumers. Another aspect of projective techniques is more of that incomplete exercises. Um, people who want to stay healthy will blank every day. Um, getting consumers to talk about it. Um, empty balloons, I am, I think, I feel. Um, especially if you take them into a grocery store, you know, what are they doing? What are they thinking? What are they feeling? And then these oftentimes are a stepping point, or I like to say a diving board when you're jumping off into a pool, into a deeper discussion. This is just a starting point. It's not the answer itself that's really depth, but it's more that discussion that you get after. Other questions designing them, you can ask uh, participants to share experiences, to reflect on past behaviors, you know, tell me about the last time you did this. We're so much better about describing past instances, you know, describing, and we have to go back and try to relive that or reconstruct those experiences. Role playing, you know, if you were in charge of marketing this brand, what would you do? Um, tell a story. Tell me about the last time um, you did this, you shopped here, um, you planned this event. Or, you know, to, how would you describe luxury to an alien? You know, projective techniques. Again, this is a jumping point to get into a conversation, just to think off top of mind, get beyond that into that depth of an answer. So listening to consumers is one of the most important skills um, because you have to truly listen to consumers to be able to follow up on what those next questions are. So in, in contrast to a survey, you're really listening to consumers and it's this back and forth engagement with them and really listening for those inner voices, listening to what they're not saying, um, listening to silence, letting it be okay. Get, in fact, when I'm doing a lot of interview research, I, I tell my participants, take a few minutes, think about this, give some thought to it, and then respond. Because that's where true insights come from. It's not from, oh, this is what I think of. No, it's like, let me think about it, give some thought, and then let me respond. So when we think of it in that way, it is this negotiated understanding. It's not that I am this expert and I'm coming and telling what the consumers think or believe, but it's this negotiated understanding. So John Sherry and Robert Kosnitz are two academics that have, I like one of their quotes in a, a reading of theirs. It says, learning to listen deeply is essential for the interviewers heard as one of the most profound, humane gifts an individual will ever receive. Listening deeply is the symbolic equivalent of holding the informant. So it's almost as if you are holding the informant. It's a precious time because we live in such a rushed, rushed, 
fast paced society to really stop and listen and want to understand our consumers is really profound. I mean, because we don't really take the time to really want to deeply listen and really think about what they're saying. And that's the beauty of qualitative research. So how can qualitative insights help brands become more human? So when we think about humanity, you know, there's this common connection for all of us, and that's what makes us human. Most people don't focus on what they have in common. Most people think about how they're different. So commonalities, you know, we all have these common emotions, feelings, desires, feelings that are maybe closer to fear or feelings of happiness. Um, we all are aging. I mean, there are these commonalities that connect us. And the pandemic in particular is something that has a, a affected all of us. So how can brands connect on that level of something common that brings co consumers together? So this is a Mintel uh, report of 2021 of just looking at how has the pandemic influenced consumer behavior. So when we think about the wide range of how it's influenced us, we think about well-being, that we're much more privy and much more um, heightened awareness of our well-being, of this physical and mental wellness. Our surroundings, we're much more um, attuned to looking around us, our external environment, um, especially enjoying the outside and the outdoors. Um, technology, we're much more connected through technology and more dependent on technology than ever before. Um, our rights, we want our rights to be heard, to be listened to, to be respected. Um, value that we look for these, you know, beyond just tangible measures, but looking at how it influences our lives too. You know, are we getting some kind of benefit from what we purchase that more than that just valuable um, of just being able to say, I own this, but what does it provide to me, to my life? And then experiences, you know, we look for this stimulation because we've been kind of connected in our homes, but how can we connect outside of our homes and looking for that discovering more stimulation? And then finally, identity. Identity is something that we are, as a society, are looking for ways to express ourselves, to connect with other people. And that's where I'm going to go a little bit more into this togetherness and identity and how brands can really connect on that one level. Um, so for brands, what does it mean? It means that digital adoption is key. That's so important to connect with people and have some interactive way of interacting with your consumers and discussing with them, hearing them, but also engaging that back and forth. Um, brands can connect through communities. Brand communities are not new. They've been around for over 10 years, but um, I think now more than ever, you know, online groups are flourishing and brands are going to have to connect with consumers in some kind of communal aspect. We look at the next, you know, now for the next 12 months, our sense of community and togetherness has really heightened and we're looking for ways to connect with people um, and looking for ways to expand our communication. So what should brands look for? You know, develop initiatives to evoke this belonging. Consumers really want to belong. Um, like I said, for that identity, give them that identity. Um, a lot of times, well, I mean, this is not new. We've always expressed our identity through brands, but brands now have this opportunity to really connect through that through that means of and and make it more of a positive we're always looking this pandemic has kind of hovered over us we're looking for ways to be more positive to to connect in ways that are good and healthy um, fostering social connections you know maintaining relationships with our our consumers and stimulating those feelings of belonging but also emotional health and that positive aspect so feeling human, you know, what makes brands feel human? This engagement, engaging with consumers, um, being authentic in that engagement and developing those digital strategies that are authentic for your brand, celebrating your audiences, not making it about the brand. I mean, now consumers, you really, they want that identity. They want to be focused. Give them the spotlight rather than the brand having the spotlight. Spotlight on your consumers. 
um, offer a helping hand, um, be there for consumers, be there for that strength, for that encouragement, um, allow them um, opportunities to donate. If your brand is involved in any kind of charity um, or work that they could, that consumers could feel a part of, that's a great way to connect with them. Or in using more of that digital approach of just that consumer brand relationship, building that strategy. So when we think about being relevant, look for ways that your brand can overlap with humanity. Look for that sweet spot. It's that sweet spot between brand and humanity. And that's where qualitative research can help you get those insights to get that deeper meaning of what really connects and what makes sense for your brand that would be truly authentic. So I'm gonna leave it there and I'll come back to answer questions, but thank you. I'll turn it over to Irene. Thanks so much, Dr. Hallenbeck. I really thought that was incredibly interesting, especially spotlighting consumers. And I think that kind of the key, it seems like, is to you know treat your consumers like humans and your brand will seem more human as well. So um, we'll get to Q&A in a little bit after Irene's presentation. So feel free to drop more questions in the chat, um, jot down anything you have, and we will ask them out loud. Um, you can press the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And remember, because everyone's muted, um, you know, we'll just get to these afterward. So um, don't worry about uh, having your question be missed. Um, thank you again, Dr. Hallenbeck. We're going to move on to our next speaker, Irene Lopez, who's going to discuss uh, how we use software to see the humans on your site. Um, before she gets started, let's get to know Irene a little bit more. Irene works as the Business Development Associate at Online Optimism, a full service full service digital marketing agency with offices in New Orleans and Atlanta. Irene uses data and analytics to gain new leads, create custom client proposals, and analyze and perfect marketing reports. Irene also schedules and prepares onboarding meetings where she goes through the project scope and discusses everything necessary to make their campaign successful. So Irene is instrumental in online optimism's um, business development and uh, really excited to have her speak on this. So take it away, Irene. Thank you, Sam. Um, as Sam said, I run business development at Online Optimism. And so I spend a lot of time talking to businesses, figuring out their strategies and, um, you know, what's going to basically reach their goals. Um, I also have past experience, you know, providing sales insights for an e-commerce e company. And I actually grew up in West London um, in England. So that's a fun fact. And I moved to the US in 2018. Cool. So before I deep dive into the ways we can learn more about your audience, it's important to learn why learning about them is key for success in your business. So let's look at a quick case study first. So Lyft identified a number of issues with their current app and they seek to make changes to the app in order to improve the user experience. I'm sure we've all used Lyft before and we, we know that, you know, the user experience on the Lyft app is really crucial in being able to, you know, uh, catch rides and everything like that. And the idea is that by improving the user experience, the app became easier to use, which increased the number of riders um, and it increased the number of uh, drivers as well. So the issues that they um, kind of identified was poor representations of the drivers that were requested, no transparency about price or estimated time of arrival, cars were not directional, it was a poor use of color, options panels were awkwardly placed and request lift was kind of vague for first time users. Um, so let's kind of look into how they came to understand those issues and what they did to overcome those issues. So through qual qualitative and quantitative data, Lyft was able to identify the issues with the app and work to correct them. So with qualitative data, Lyft actually conducted Q&A sessions with both users and drivers to understand the, the biggest challenges that people had with the app. These sessions were held weekly during the redesign of the app. Um, qualitative data, as Candice has mentioned, can be really useful to help businesses uh, better understand how to improve their apps or their websites. However, sometimes gathering quality data can often be very expensive or complex. As Candice also mentioned, you know, um, that it could be really hard to understand the human side um, of your business. So setting up those weekly sessions um, that Lyft did and then providing participants with an incentive to join can be, join can be quite challenging. With quantitative data as well, um, this is mostly what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, in this example, Lyft ran a number of A-B tests on their app to find out which features users really liked and didn't like. So when implementing the new features, they sometimes, they sometimes found that how they wanted to redesign their app didn't actually resonate with the user. So that's a really key part of understanding the humans on your site or on any apps that you have, um, that sometimes knowing that works, what works great for you in your mind may not be what the user necessarily wants. 
So as a result, they've managed to successfully redesign um, their app and their users front with their users front and center. This not only translated to a swanky new app, but also played a part in increasing the number of writers over time. And of course, more writers equals more revenue, which is success for their business. Um, in the graph that you can see on the left-hand side, the graph kind of shows um, active Lyft riders from 2016, which is when they completed the app redesign to 2020. And active riders increased by 554% in four years, which is incredible. Um, I'm sure not only was the app um, a really big uh, part of that but you know people using Lyft more often for a number of different reasons but I'm sure the app also played a part in that. So now that we've discussed why it's important to understand users let's discuss how we can implement this knowledge for your business but before that let's quickly kind of go over where you may be seeing the disconnect between what you provide um, as your business and how your customers are actually converting. So we've got some clear understanding and um, let's move on to um, how we can see where the information might be getting lost in your business. So with regards to success in um, you know, your digital marketing and your online presence, we essentially see this as three kind of main steps. So users will access your website, they complete some kind of conversion action, with, whether that's a form, a fill, a purchase, a newsletter sign up, and that counts as success for your business. Um, though this may seem fairly straightforward um, as it's just a few steps, of course, there's a lot of little steps in between that. It's worth looking into where the disconnects lie in this process and where data can help fill in the gap so you can have more insight insights into your business and improve this process for customers. So the first disconnect can happen where you may be wondering, how do I even get users to my website in the first place? You could be putting out lots of great content, but still notice that your traffic is low. There are a number of, way, a number of ways to overcome this initial disconnect. And a lot of it can be sold with marketing strategy. So um, that could be a, you know, a social media strategy, a search engine optimization strategy, and a number of different others. And of course, depending on your business or your organization or your industry, the marketing strategy can change very, very drastically. Now, it's all well and good having, you know, an excellent uh, marketing strategy, but it's really important for you to understand where, where your users are still coming, so, coming from. So before implementing any strategy, you want to ensure that you set up your Google Analytics accurately so that your strategies are being tracked. So two key parts of Google Analytics to check for when tracking your campaigns are the acquisition tab and the pages report. So the acquisition tab gives you more detailed information about where your website traffic is coming from. So using this data, you can begin to understand which strategies are performing well and which ones not so well. Based on this information, you can adjust your marketing strategies accordingly. You might be spending a great deal of time on your social media strategy only to find out that your pay-per-click strategy is working better. So that way you can uh, you know, adjust um, your budgets accordingly. The pages report also gives a detailed um, analysis about traffic on each page. If you set up sec the secondary dimension in the pages report as source slash medium, you can see what type of traffic is being generated to which pages. Um, you may find that a particular page drives more traffic from organic search than from paid social. Again, with this knowledge, you can better um, adjust your strategies with what resonates best with your audience. Now let's assume you have um, a great marketing strategy in place. You've got your analytics set up and you're ready to optimize your campaign based on what works. This is a great first step. And so we can move on from that. So now you have that consistent quality traffic and you know where the traffic is coming from. So this is great. However, you realize that that traffic still isn't converted and you're rightfully so frustrated. Um, so that's what we're gonna refer to as like the second disconnect. So unlike Lyft, you may not have the time or the necessary resources to conduct market research or set up focus groups and, and such. As Candace did mention, it can be really hard for researchers to find that natural human approach and those deeper meanings through qualitative research. This is kind of where you can turn to data to fill in those gaps and to better understand your customers and set up your site with human interaction in mind. So let's discuss conversion rate optimization, what it is and how it helps overcome that second disconnect. So the process of getting customers to actually convert is called conversion rate optimization. It may seem intuitive that the more traffic you get to your website, the more conversions you get. But if you're not op optimizing your website for conversions, then all that newly found traffic isn't giving your business the success you deserve. So improving the user experience for users who have already reached your website works out to be more cost effective for you and more useful for your already engaged customers. It's a lot easier to convince an interested customer to convert than it is to interest an entirely new individual. 
So did you know that acquiring a new customer can cost five times more than ret retaining an existing customer? US companies also lose $136 billion per year due to avoidable consumer switching and lower customers are five times as likely to repurchase, five times as likely to forgive, four times as likely to refer and seven times as likely to try a new offering. So it just goes to show that there are a number of reasons why it's easier to kind of keep the engaged users on your site to convert than it is to try and find new users. So there are a number of ways you can improve conversion. So let's look at some of the potential ways. So videos for one, in recent years, videos have been become the most easily digestible and most engaging type of content there is. Um, videos can be used to entice, educate and delight users into making a purchase decision. As you've seen with most of the new social media networks like introducing um, Instagram Reels and TikTok and things like that, it's all heavily focused around videos to kind of engage that user. Easy checkout. So this is really key for e-commerce businesses. It's absolutely crucial. Only ask the information you absolutely need in order in, in any contact forms or in any checkouts. If you add far too many form fields, a user can become disinterested, disinterested and abandon their conversion. So you just ask for what you need and hopefully that, um, that uh, customer will get to the end of that conversion. Reviews and testimonials as well work great to provide proof of the great products and services that you provide. According to a study from iPerception, 63% of customers are more likely to make a purchase from a site that has user reviews. So make it easier for customers to be able to leave a review, perhaps provide an incentive. Maybe they get 10% off their next order or something along those lines. Urgency, again, this is a great way to get users to convert if they're hesitating. And this tactic works especially um, well with e-commerce brands. I'm sure if you've ever purchased anything online, they might have a tab at the top that says, you've only got 10 hours before the sale runs out and things like this. So getting that urgency to the consumer is a great way for them to um, consider conversion. Live chat as well. So getting customers directly to a representative is a great way to help them to convert, especially for customers that are ready to convert and just need that extra push. Um, so utilizing a live chat can really, really help them because they're speaking directly to a human being rather than um, just to a computer. As Candace says, having that human connection um, with the person will also help you out. So now there are a number of ways you can optimize your conversion rate, even more than what is on this slide. But trying all these options a little bit like throwing spaghetti on the wall to see what sticks. So before implementing any of the changes, you need to kind of understand how the humans are currently behaving so you can um, improve on that. So let's look at a couple of ways that we can better understand user behavior on your website to co improve conversions. So there are a number of tools available to you to better understand website traffic. One key one being Google Analytics, but I will talk about another one in a, in a moment. So using the behavior tab, you can easily identify how users flow through your website. This can provide you with lots of key information. Um, and sometimes it can be hard with any analytics tool. If you're not very familiar with analytics, just seeing a bunch of numbers can be really difficult to kind of gauge what those numbers actually mean. So let's kind of look at what that means. So with this behavior tab, you can see the behavior flow. Um, and this is a, an example on this slide. So you can see where users go from the landing page. And once you know that, you can highlight um, particular behavior flows from this chart. And you can see where people do go depending on which landing page they first viewed. Um, you can simply click on the landing page on Google Analytics at, that you want to explore and either highlight it or explore it. And Google Analytics will kind of show you where those users flow through your website. It's really, really key because you can understand if um, people are going to particular landing pages, it shows you what they're most interested in. So it gives you also valuable insights into redrafting your mega menu. So every website has a, a mega menu, but sometimes it's hard to tell what pages you need to include in it. We have lots of great services and an amazing team and they all deserve the spotlight in the menu. However, look at your behavior flow to make more informed decisions. In this example, as you can see, the top visited pages after landing on the home page are the contact page, the resource page, and our specialist program and our team. So based on this, we know to include those pages in our main menu as, that's what's, as that's, that is what people are interested in. If you see that there's a page in your main menu that very, users, that very few users actually click on, it might be time to remove that page from your main menu. You don't want your main menu to be overwhelming to the user, it should just contain the information that they need. You can also analyze which pages have a high or low exit rate. So a high exit rate may suggest lack of engagement or that there could be an issue with the page. Be mindful that on some pages with a high exit rate might be a good thing, 
For example, your company may have an external job website. If you see a high exit rate on your careers page, it may be that a lot of people are heading to that external website, which is completely fine. Um, and a low exit rate may suggest that your audience is engaged with that specific page. So this is a prime opportunity to find out where they go next. In this example, you can see a majority of traffic that land on our homepage, go straight to the contact page, which is ideal. When analyzing your business, keep in mind that if a large majority of users are heading to the About Us page, make it easy for them to find that page. Also ensure that the top visited pages have clear call to actions where it feels natural. All right. Remaining in the behavior tab of Google Analytics, you can view page performance. Again, this provides other key information such as engagement. So engagement can be identified by high average time spent on page. So with pages that have a high average time spent, you can deduce that users are actively engaging with the page. With that in mind, be sure to check these pages often in the pages report of Google Analytics. Of course, prioritize pages that have higher number of page views. You can also start to identify key trends. So if you see a particular set of pages that have high average time on page, offer more of that similar content to your website users. For example, in our top pages by average time spent, there are a number of pages that appear with content about Instagram and about our culture. With this knowledge, we know to produce more content around these particular topics. You can also understand where to include clear calls to action. So on pages with high engagement, so that could be average time spent, you know, a low exit rate, be sure to include those calls to action. The users are already engaged with the content. So if you'd like them to convert, make sure the calls to actions are clear on the pages they're most interested in. Another more recent tool that has come uh, recently is Microsoft Clarity, which can provide even further data. While I wouldn't recommend to, you know, leave everything behind with Google Analytics and move to Clar uh, Microsoft Clarity, they do work really well in tandem to provide um, extra information. So Clarity provides insights into heat maps, scroll depth, and a number of other metrics that Google Analytics might not be able to provide. So with heat maps, heat maps and click tracking, Heat maps essentially show you which areas of the web page that users hover and click over. In this example, you can see that many people click on the Our Team page and the Our Values page. It also shows you rage clicks. So rage clicks is um, where users rapidly click or tap in the same small area. And so when you check for that, you can check to see that um, it might be an indication that the loading speed of the page is slow or that the part of the page actually doesn't link to where it's supposed to. There's also dead clicks. So if someone clicks on something with no effect, you need to double check for these kinds of things. A non-responsive website is one of the many reasons that a user may not convert and might just um, bounce off the page anyway. So you wanna ensure that all the links are heading to the right places. It also shows you what they call quick backs. So if a user navigates to a page, then quickly returns to the previous one. A user may quickly return to a previous page for a number of reasons. Uh, one of the main re ones being site load speed. So if that page takes too long to load, then a user may either just exit the site altogether or go back to the page that they previously were on. If you notice a key page with a high number of quick packs, you may need to assess the loading speed of that page. Try using smaller images by file size and get rid of any complex plugins when needed. Scroll depth shows you how far users are scrolling on your web pages, which Clarity can provide you with. So that use this information to understand how much of your site content users are actually consuming. You could be writing lots of detailed blog posts, but it's mo if most of the traffic isn't scrolling to the bottom of the page, then taking the time to create that content may not be the best use of your time. Alternatively, if you notice that not many of your audience scrolls to the very bottom of a page, you could also think about moving your call to action further up the page to ensure that most of them see it. So to wrap up, let's look at ways you can begin to start identifying those users on your website. If you haven't already, start setting up for Google Analytics, poke around and see what you can find about your business and think about where your website traffic is coming from, what pages they visit and how they interact with those pages. Use the behavior flow tab. Check this tab in Google Analytics and find one change you can make to your website to better direct your traffic to convert. Check what content is resonating best with your audience and work to create similar content for them. You could do this by checking which pages are most popular and how much average time people are spending on those pages. Thank you so much for listening and I'll take it back to Sam. Wow, thanks so much, Irene. Uh, it's really interesting to see how the data can really show you what people are doing on the different websites that you may be working on. I'm excited to dive into Microsoft Clarity a bit more and really understand, you know, rage clicks especially. Um, and it's also clear how qualitative and quantitative data go hand in hand. So 
I appreciate um, both you, Irene, and Dr. Hollenbeck really explaining that. So now is the official Q&A time, so feel free to drop those questions in the chat. We've got a few questions already, so we can get them started. What I'd like to do is I'd like to ask the questions and I'll address them to um, one of you, but feel free to chime in and make it an open discussion if you have thoughts on the question or kind of how people can improve their businesses and of course, humanize their brand. So uh, let's get started. So this one is for Dr. Hollenbeck. So as a general rule of thumb, how many people do you need to talk to for qualitative research? What's the kind of sweet spot there? And does it depend on the brand or the company size? And what are your thoughts? So yeah, so qualitative is for insights only. It's not to generalize. So a lot of um, a lot of people want to generalize or make big decisions based on qualitative and qualitative. The beauty of it is to get those deeper insights. But if you were making big decisions, then to follow up on quant. Um, so you, you can't use qual to sub for quant and can't use quant to sub for qual that they really have two different purposes. So in terms of focus groups, I guess, uh, let's just say focus groups is one of the most popular. Um, you I mean, it, it, you want to reach saturation so that you're hearing the same thing over and over. Um, it depends on if you're just wanting to get some insights to test to, to test in a survey or if you're wanting to see like brand perceptions, like how people perceive our brand. Um, you could have different focus groups across the country. But when you know that you've re the, the beauty of qual is that you kind of is this evolving methodology so that when you start hearing those same responses, then you're finished. You're done. You don't need to, to ask anymore. Typically in a focus group, we say like 10, 10 folks in a focus group. Um, it depends on how intimate you want it to be. I mean, you could make it smaller um, or larger. Sometimes if it's more sensitive topics, the smaller the setting might be better. But with qualitative, you want to remember that you want them to be homogeneous groups, that there's something that connects them together. Because uh, say, for example, you had faculty and students in a focus group. Well, that wouldn't go well. Like, who's going to do most of the talking? Faculty. Students are going to usually, you know, if they're faculty or faculty members sitting there, they won't speak up as much. Or if you had doctors and patients. So you want to have some kind of commonality that's going to make people want to talk and want to open up. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, a, an interesting point about making sure that they have something in common or else they wouldn't feel, you know, welcome to say with their, their true thoughts. I um, appreciate that. So on this, in the same vein, so let's say you have a team that approaches things, you know, in a qualitative lens. How can you get them to think of things more quantitatively and, and vice versa. Yeah, so I would say in terms of getting them to think quantitatively, like just reminding them that, that the purpose of both methodologies, that the purpose of qual is to develop those insights, the purpose of quant is to generalize. Let's see, you know, how many people are doing this or like Irene showed, like let's, let's study the flow of traffic or behavior in general and trying to track patterns. Um, for qual, like when I teach my students about it, it's actually the verbs that you use can differentiate the strategy to explore, to understand, to gather insights. Like that's going to be qual to test to get um, a wide scope, you know, that's going to be a quant approach. So anytime, so if you think about the strategies to test an idea or to test a hypothesis or to see how wide ranging it is, you want to do quant. So in terms of getting people on board, I think it's just knowing which strategy you need. It begins with the research question you're trying to answer. And then once you know what you're trying to answer, then fit the methodology to that research question. I think just to add on to Candace as well on the quantitative side, it can be difficult when you're just um, kind of bombarded with a lot of numbers and percentages whenever you're looking at things like analytics. And so it's kind of understanding what you can deduce from those numbers, which is really important to kind of get people on board to understanding that quantitative data, quantitative data can provide you with really useful insights. You just need to know what to deduce from the numbers you're seeing. Yeah, and qual can go on the beginning or the end. It can go pre-quant or post-quant. Um, because pre, it can help you know what to test in a survey. Post, it can help you understand the survey. Like maybe you've got some results back and it's like, what, this doesn't make any sense. Well, you can go and do call on the back end as well. Um, so it can be, the, I mean, ideally, if you have the time and money, it's ideal to do both. Yeah, and it seems 
that you don't want too little data or too much data because it can be hard to really understand what it is you're looking at. I know specifically working with Irene that, you know, if we're looking at Google Analytics, there can be so much there that, um, you know, it takes someone with a good eye to be able to assess what is important. Um, okay, on that note, Irene, this question's for you. What elements are critical on a website to get users to convert to customers? So there are a number of ones that I talked about in my presentation, and I would say one of the key ones is just making the conversion process as simple as possible. You don't want people to have to trail through pages and pages to find your contact page. You don't want it to take more than, you know, three three pages before someone gets to the, you know, thank you for your order page um, and stuff like that. So you want to keep your um, contact form really, really simple. If you're um, a B2B business, for example, that might literally just be a name and an email address. If you're an e-commerce business, just get exactly what you need, the name, the address, you know, what they've ordered and their card information. Don't need to ask a lot of other questions like reviews and things like that. And while they're helpful, um, it sometimes does require giving a person, you know, that incentive to want to uh, finish up a review. Um, so I wouldn't include that in any of, you know, the conversion stages. So yeah, I would say just keeping it as simple as possible, making those calls to action really, really clear and keeping your forms really simple. Absolutely. I mean, you don't want to get lost on a website. I think that, you know, people talk about three clicks away from whatever the ideal destination is that you're, you're looking for. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, Dr. Hollenbeck, this question is for you. So what do you think is the difference between consumers in the U.S. and consumers internationally? Are there, are there major differences that we can think about um, from a qualitative perspective? And, uh, and what are your thoughts there? Absolutely. Um, I mean, there are differences even within the U.S., parts of the U.S. Are, are, so any part of um, the, the country that you're studying, it's going to have cultural differences. Um, even within the country, there are cultural. So when we think about studying culture, I mean, there is U.S. culture, but then you can even become more micro to Southern culture, or you can even even here within Athens, where I'm at, even the University of Georgia culture, um, and you can have global culture. So with there are different layers of culture that influence our behavior. And so I think it's very important to think about, you know, where your brand is going to be, how your brand is going to be interacting and to understand those cultural differences. Um, so however you slice it, I mean, but there are multiple ways that you can slice it to explore and understand cultural differences, but the, the, absolutely there are cultural differences. Yeah. And that, and that goes back to, I'm sure finding, you know, the right types of groups that you need to uh, interview or have focus groups with to, to figure out what's important for your brand. So. Yeah, it de definitely goes back to your research question. Like, what do you want to understand? You know, who is your target market? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, going from there to deciding what the methodology you want. So a lot of times, you know, if there's something new or fancy, whether it's analytics or whether it's new types of qualitative data with, um, you know, netnographies online or things, sometimes it's it can be these glamorous methods that kind of attract us. But it really, instead of letting the method drive you, it needs to be the research question. Question, like what do you want to know and then once you have that really solid research question then decide the best methodology how do we approach it what would be best and there's always going to be trade-offs there's always going to be um you know because we don't have all the time and money so there's always going to be trade-offs on which methodology is going to be best and what's going to help us answer the question but that's the nice thing about working in teams to strategize and come up with the best methodology based on the time and money that you have Exactly. All right. Um, this one is for Irene. So how can we use analytics to understand customer behavior if your goals aren't very sales focused, for example? So you're not necessarily trying to buy, you know, X, Y, or Z. So yeah, I would say a key component of that is providing people with great content. And with that great content, they can see you as a thought leader in your um, particular industry. And say, for example, you're a B2B business, so you're not very sales focused, i.e. you're not an e-commerce company. Um, you know, having that key content that people can be like, okay, I understand what your business does. I understand that you're a thought leader. And therefore, I want to talk to you about what 
services you provide. And um, when you're building out that content, sometimes it's easy to just kind of focus on what you think the consumer wants. So by using analytics, you can actually understand with what your uh, current consumers are already engaging with. So for example, with online optimism, a lot of people engage with you know any content that we create about Instagram or about our culture. And based on that, we can make you know some deductions that that is what people are interested in, and we can build content around those particular topics and understand that if someone reaches out to us because they saw a really cool Instagram blog post, um, and then they reach out to us for Instagram marketing or something like that, you know, we can see where where understanding what that user was interested in actually led us to you know a conversion which wasn't necessarily sales focused. Cool. That makes a lot of sense. We've got one last question for you, Irene, but Dr. Hollenbeck, feel free to jump in. Um, have you faced any difficulties in tracking consumers with growing concerns about user privacy? So obviously that's something that a lot of you know, social media sites and internet sites are thinking about. So um, what are your, your thoughts on that, Irene? Yeah, there has been quite a few difficulties, especially in the past um, couple of years. So I know recently Facebook changed their privacy settings with iOS, which made a lot of difference in, you know, reporting and things like that. And I think um, over time, there is likely to, it's likely to be even more difficult to be able to track users as, you know, privacy becomes a bigger and bigger concern. Um, I would assume in the future, what we can likely see is that instead of being able to track users for an extended period of time, we might be able to track them for a shorter period of time. So being able to understand when they came to your website to when they converted could be really tricky in the future because oftentimes people don't convert the first time they go to your website. You know, they usually come to your website a couple of times, and then they may convert 30 days later, 60 days later. It really depends on, you know, where they're at in the sales funnel. So I think that's gonna be tricky in the future. So we're gonna have to find new ways to be able to track customers and you know understand where those customers are coming from so we can understand the best way to you know market ourselves yeah i mean it's a trade-off it's something that we've been talking about for a while now dr hollenbeck do you have any thoughts on privacy in terms of qualitative research um well it's always going to be a matter of again negotiating and making sure that they feel comfortable i mean qualitative is a um i mean you're supposed to protect the the, the identity of participants and secure that anonymity for them um, and that is something that is part of the research design is that they should be protected but of course they might need reassurance of that of just reassuring that you know that they're that you're just interested in what they're saying you're not interested in who said what but more of who what they're saying and that they're representing other people so i think having some ground rules like if you're having a focus group or an in-depth interview just setting some ground rules first just to let them know you know please take your time um in, in you know pause if you need to pause um we're not interested in in you as a person so much as what you're representing that you're representing all the other women that are age 35 to 45 and that live in Chicago and you can talk about what it's like to wear shoes um, or on a day-to-day -day basis like we want to hear from you and you're representing other people in Chicago so those kind of things just giving them that freedom and try knowing that confidentiality is a concern for all people and just giving them that reassurance yeah, and I'm sure that privacy and that reassurance of privacy can garner more honesty in the responses. So that that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, all right, do we have any more questions? Uh, I don't see any more in the Q and A chat. Um, all right, well that wraps it up with our Q and A session. I want to give another special thanks to our speakers, Dr. Candice Hollenbeck and Irene Lopez. Um, again, Dr. Hollenbeck is a senior lecturer at the University of Georgia and conducts research on consumer behavior. You can follow her, follow her on LinkedIn or follow UGA on Twitter uh, at UGA MMR. And Irene Lopez is the business development associate at Online Optimism, a full, ser full service digital marketing agency with offices in New Orleans and Atlanta. You can find our organization at onlineoptimism.com or on Twitter at Online Optimism. So, Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Don't forget to sign up for our next webinar and continue in this six-part series. We've got four more webinars left, um, and we'll be posting this link on our website and social media channels. So 
feel free to reach out with any questions at info at onlineoptimism.com. But other than that, thank you all so much for coming. And Sam, I want just a shout out. We have a great MMR program here. I didn't mention our master's in marketing research. Like it does qual and quant. So if anyone's interested in getting a graduate degree, it's a year program. It's an excellent, it's a full-time program, but an excellent program. Or if you're a business and looking at recruiting, our students graduate in spring and they're actually currently interviewing. We always have 100% placement. It's a cohort program where they begin and end together. So it's a really close knit program. We usually have 20 to 30 students. So it's a small close knit community that we have that developed in our MMR program, but feel free. Yeah, you can go and check it out if you're interested in getting a degree, if you're interested in recruiting. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. And you know, we love to see that continuing education. So thank you again. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Really appreciate it. And we'll post this link uh, on our website. So feel free to uh, look it up there. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.